and reverse if you see if the electromagnetic wave is converted back to voltage and current this process is called induction okay. so any questions you have is it clear what basically the antenna does You can reply. Is there anything needs to be explained? I can add it here. Yeah. So next, when you see the type of antennas, you know there are different types of the antennas, you know. So I can basically categorize all those antennas into three groups. So the first category, I can call it as a wire antennas. You know, first of all, if you take a small copper wire, you know that that wire can also act like an antenna right okay F basically if you want to do an experiment you can do it here suppose if you have a copper wire let us say uh, you can consider a length of 2 meter approximately this is going to behave like an as an uh, like as an antenna actually what happens uh, in earlier days you know so there is no uh, this uh, tata sky video con all these things and are not there right so they used to mount a what you can call aguda antenna at the top of your house and from the aguda antenna output is connected through a coaxial cable and it is going to connect to your television and the same experiment you can do you can do here how this wire can act like an antenna was you can do one simple experiment i will tell you suppose all in your home if you see the television at the back side there is a coaxial port that is a place where you know you are connecting a coaxial cable from the antenna mounted on the top of your house so you can find that uh, coaxial port and what you do you take this copper wire of at least two meter to three meter length the higher the length is more recommended so you connect one end of the wire to your coaxial this port and the other end you just brought it outside of your home and left it open you don't connect anything here what actually you can see in your television is you are going to see your Dora Darshan channel because that is unlicensed, you know, anybody can see. So there is no encryption kind of thing. So in that way, what actually happening here, this wire, what you are, you are connecting is going to behave like an antenna. And obviously what you can see, the really interesting thing was when you connect the more length of the wire, you can see more clarity in your television. And at the same time, you try to maintain this wire at least one meter from the ground plane. In order to avoid the reflections, if you are maintaining at least one meter separation from the ground, you can see the audio will be very clear. Okay. So you may have a doubt how this wire can act like an antenna and it can receive the signal. Okay. First, we, uh, this is basically happens through our electromagnetic understanding, right? Suppose, let me call it as a transmitting antenna, then I will come back to receiving antenna. So when you have a wire, and if you feed a voltage and current, so what this antenna is doing, it is converting into electromagnetic waves. But the thing is, how this conversion takes place? You know that when you pass a time varying current, there will be a time varying magnetic field. Correct. It is a basic simple physics. When you have a time varying current, since antenna is a passive element and every wire is going to create a magnetic field. Okay. So whenever there is a change of the magnetic field, you know that electric field also will be created using your Faraday's law. So what it says, the curl of E is equal to the change of magnetic flux with respect to time. So basically the current is the source for creating magnetic field and in turn the change of the magnetic field is going to create your electromagnetic wave this is how the conversion takes place at the antenna okay now having said that it is very clear now when it comes back to this particular case how this is exactly going to receive the video signals it was basically if you see the video signals it will be typically in the range of some hundreds of megahertz 
okay any antenna if you take it is more efficient provided if the length of the element is much closer to the operating wavelength okay suppose when you take a 100 megahertz calculate the wavelength calculate the wavelength for 100 megahertz it is propagating in free space so calculate the wavelength and tell me Three meter, sir. Yeah, correct. Three meter. So when the length of your copper wire is close to three meter, it can exactly behave like an efficient antenna, which can receive the maximum energy. The, so the fund of fundamental principle is same. If you say any wire antenna is a good radiator or good receiver, the length of that element should be proportional to the wavelength, which means very close to the operating wavelength. So in this case. Your video signals, if you exactly see, you know, the length is exactly equal to the wavelength. So it is going to receive the video signals properly. So that's how it happens. And first of all, when you see the wire antennas, so there are different type of wire antennas is there. All your dipole configurations, you can say you may have a monopole and you may have a dipole or you may have a short dipole. Okay, then what else you, you will have? You can say half wave dipole. So all these uh, antennas can be categorized as a wire antennas. So especially in case of wire antennas, what is going to be matter is the length of the antenna is going to be more crucial. If the length of the antenna is matching to your operating wavelength, it will be a good efficient uh, radiator or it can be a good receiver. So when it comes to the aperture antennas, aperture antenna, somebody has already replied here, right, earlier, horn antenna and parabolic antenna. So those are called your aperture antennas. Typically, you know, horn antennas and parabolic antennas are widely used in the satellite communication and radar communication when you are operating at gigahertz frequencies. Okay. So in that case, what will happen? Aperture antenna is same as your kind of wavegate structure. So this is how your hard antenna looks like. And you would have been seeing the parabolic antennas. You can see your uh, television antennas, all these things right now. So what is going to be matter here, aperture antennas is, if your area of cross section is very high, you are going to receive the maximum energy. So if there are any applications where you want to capture the more energy from the antenna, you have to go for the aperture antennas. That is what more important in the higher frequency. So your horn antenna and parabolic antenna are an example of the aperture antenna. And the next thing comes the array type of antennas. When I was talking about antenna arrays, there are so many antennas which are going to be cascaded like this. Can you tell me any example where you are going to cascade so many antennas in series or you can say sorry parallel. Can you give an example? Have you seen the Yagi Uda antenna anytime? Yagi Uda? So if you see here, the Aguada antenna is going to consist of dipoles in uh, parallel like this. Okay. This kind of structure would have been seen in olden days, but nowadays it is invisible. Okay, When you are cascading so many number of dipoles like this, you know, it is going to cover a broad range of frequencies. And at the same time, your gain is going to be increased rather than having only one dipole antenna. If you cascade more number of antennas in picture, your efficient gain of the antenna will increase and at the same time, your operating frequency range is also going to be more. So if you see the antenna arrays, I can say that Aguda antenna is an example. And if you go to the microwave, there are micro strip patch arrays will be there. 
and even you can see your lock periodic antenna like this uh, so antenna arrays means you are cascading the number of antennas in parallel in order to increase the gain and in order to increase the overall frequency range of the operation so do you have any questions here to discuss Do you have any questions to discuss? Yeah. So next, basically, if you see what kind of radiation and what is an equation for electric field and magnetic field for different type of antennas, you know, basically, all these equations cannot be mathematically derived. There is a simulation software like CST. you know where we always used to work on with the antennas okay so all these equations are basically depends on the simulation results but i have written this equation just to give some important information about this okay suppose if you have a wire whose length is lesser than lambda by 10 this configuration is basically said to be a hergian dipole suppose if your length of the element is greater than lambda by 10 you can categorize it as a short dipole and you know that if the length is exactly equal to lambda by 2 that is said to be half wave dipole okay first of all when you consider for the hergian dipole and if you solve the maxwell's equations okay what is that maxwell equation curl of h and curl of e you know that you are going to get all these equations so what this equation says you need not to remember the equations first okay so when you have the antenna placed in this uh, let us say in z direction you are going to have two components of the electric field one will be in radial direction and one will be in the elevation plane so we have one radial direction and one theta component in the elevation plane and you know that magnetic field will be there obviously in phi direction why because if any current is passing through this element if it is oscillating it is going to create the magnetic field so it is very important to recognize in this slide that your electric field if you see basically it is a function of 1 by r 1 by r square and 1 by r cube okay and your er may be it is a function of r square and r cube and h phi is also function of r and r square that doesn't matter but if you see the combined variation your electric field is going to function of 1 by r 1 by r square and 1 by r cube okay, let me say your e theta now what will happen you can make an approximation based upon the value of the radial distance so what is this radial distance represents that means when you are at a distance of r from the antenna what kind of approximations you can make so the first thing is what when your r is very very small that means when you are very closer to the antenna so if this is your antenna and your r is very very small when you are very close to the antenna what is going to happen so if we say 1 by r is significant and 1 by r square is very significant because r is very small and 1 by r cube is very very significant so when r is very small you can say that 1 by r square and 1 by r cube are very dominant so you can say compared to 1 by r and 1 by r cube this term can be neglected okay similarly what will happen when r is very very high when r is very very high 1 by r is dominant and 1 by r square and 1 by r cube is going to be neglected so what it basically means when you are near to the source your second and third parameters are going to be more dominant so in that case if you see the equation 
r square and r cube terms can be considered and your r term will be neglected and when you are going very very far away from the source you can consider only this one and you can ignore these two so why i was telling you this one was there is a concept of near field and far field or you can say the induction region and the plane wave region so when you are very closer to the source your 1 by r square and 1 by r cube terms are dominant this kind of region is basically called near fields or it is also called as induction fields when if you are crossing this particular point let us say i will i will define what is this exact boundary where you can call 1 by r is the dominant so this basically region is said to be plane wave region or it is also said to be the radiation field so the transition basically is exactly said to be at r is equal to lambda by 6 so if you do the mathematics at r is equal to lambda by 6 your induction field by considering these two and radiation field by considering this one is going to be equal okay so there is a transition that is called r is equal to lambda by 6 so when your r is lesser than lambda by 6 the conclusion is simple it is basically said to be the near field and when r is greater than or equal to lambda by 6 you can call it as a far field especially in near field 1 by r square and 1 by r cube are dominant and in far field 1 by r is going to be dominant okay so that is what the meaning of the induction and radiation fields so induction means when you are near to the source and radiation means you are very very far away from the source okay and memorizing the equations are not important again i was uh, repeating that point okay so the next thing is very very important for your gate right now so these parameters you have to understand okay so first of all antenna means what you know it is basically a resistive element or you can say it is called a radiated element so when you are talking about any antenna this can be modeled using this parameter like a simple resistive network so when you feed some kind of energy into the antenna so the antenna will possess some kind of distribution uh, that you can call it as uh, a loss resistance and some amount of energy is getting radiated that is i can call it as a radiation resistance so the first thing the radiation resistance represents the efficiency of the antenna in order to dissipate or in order to radiate the more el electromagnetic energy into the space so what will happen suppose if i feed some energy here what should be the value of radiation resistance if i want to transfer maximum energy into the space if the radiation resistance should be higher or lesser lesser tell me yeah lesser it should be less less why 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 less more current no 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 when you are talking about electromagnetic energy you are talking about uh, you know power hello the higher the higher the resist radiation resistance the more power can be radiated into the space using your suppose if you say some current is flowing here in the circuit so what is the total power radiated by that is equal to i square into r so if the radiation resistance is very high means that antenna can easily radiate the power into the space okay it's the other way so first of all how to define efficiency then you can understand that it has to be very high okay first of all what do you mean by efficiency when you say you are 100% efficiency your lot loss resistance has to be equal to zero so i can define efficiency like this 
that this is my input power from the source and the output radiated power is wr okay how to define efficiency in case is the ratio of radiated power divided by the total input power fed to the circuit so what is the radiated power here that is equal to i square into the radiation resistance divided by so when you see the input power it should be the power loss across this resistance and drop across this one so you are going to get i square into the loss resistance plus radiation resistance so the efficiency is the radiation resistance divided by the loss resistance of the antenna plus radiation resistance now you tell me when i will get 100% efficiency when i will get 100% efficiency so if you want to express in percentage you just multiply with 100 tell me quickly Your 100% efficiency is possible provided your loss resistance is zero. Okay, you should not have any losses when you feed some power into the antenna. So if the loss resistance is zero, you can get 100% efficiency. Okay, so this is basically how the efficiency of the antenna will be determined. Now you can see clearly that the higher the radiation resistance compared to the loss resistance. Okay, when I say higher the radiation resistance means it should be compared to resistance this ratio can be equated to 1 then in that case you will get 100% efficiency so ultimately when I summarize here the radiation resistance is the resistance of the antenna if it is very very high compared to the loss resistance you can get the maximum efficiency so this is one of the important parameters when you are talking about any antenna Yeah. Next one. There are different type of uh, parameters are there, and the next one is an isotropic radiator. So, what do you mean by isotropic radiator? You know, there is nothing like really isotropic radiator is existing. It is a hypothetical point source which emits the radiation in all the directions. Suppose it is considered to be a point antenna where it can radiate in all the directions uniformly. Okay. That is said to be your isotropic radiator. But ideally, you cannot have any point antenna with a zero radius. But why the isotropic radiator is defined was the main important parameters like gain and directivity, all these are defined in comparison with the isotropic radiator. So generally, if you see the unit of the gain, you know, they used to mention in terms of dBi. I stands for isotropic. So compared to the isotropic antenna, how many times your antenna will be more better so the isotropic antenna can work as an for all other antennas so the reason why your gain and directivity will be measured by compared to the isotropic radiator so the isotropic radiator is a hypothetical point source which emits the radiation in all the directions uniformly so you can say that for an isotropic radiator the gain will be equal to one since it is radiating in all the directions, you can consider the gain will be equal to 1. Okay. And the next parameter is the power density. Power density you have already studied in our uh, wave propagation, right? You have remembered the pointing vector. The power density is basically defined as the power per unit area. So tell me the units. 
So quickly tell me what is the unit of that? Tell me what is the power density unit? Are you able to hear me? Is watts per meter square, correct? Okay. So you can basically see the equation, you know, when you are talking about antenna, okay, let us say this is my antenna. Even in the waveguides introduction also I told you, when you are very near to the source, the power density will be very high. If you consider the same surface very, very far away, the power density decreases. Okay. So the power density is basically depends from one point to the other point. So you know that in a spherical system, the point is characterized by all the three parameters, r, theta and phi. So that is the reason why I have defined V of r, theta, phi is the power density which is a function of all three parameters. Because you know, when you are moving from one point to the other point, the power density changes. So when you move from this point to this point means, in worst case, all these parameters would have been changed. R should have been changed, theta and phi also would have been changed. So the power density is basically depends on all these three parameters. That is the ratio of the radiated power divided by the area. You can say the differential power divided by the differential area. So to understand this, you can see an example. So I have a dipole antenna. Okay. Assume that the wave is propagating in this particular direction. And you have put a surface here in the direction of uh, propagation. So the power density is, def <coughs> is defined as how much power is passing through this particular surface. So the power per area, I can call it as a power density. And even if you see the pointing vector I have defined, the power density is basically one by two times E cross H. If you see the average power density, and you know that H can be replaced by E by eta. So the value can be E square by two eta. So if you're telling the power density in terms of power per area, you can change it as power per area or in terms of electric field, you can say E square by 2 E. And it's the reverse right now. Suppose if we know the power density, how to find out the power? So the total power can be found out by multiplying the power density with a area. You know, when you are talking about this particular area, your R will be constant. So, when you see the case, the change in theta will be R into d theta. And change in phi will be R into d phi. Okay. So, that is the reason why I have written R square sin theta d theta d phi. So, if I want to explain this again, I have to go back to the first class. Where you have defined. What is the differential surface for a constant R surface? Okay, so the summary is very simple. The power density is basically defined as the power per area. And the total radiated power is the double integration of the power density over any surface. Suppose if the surface is having a constant R surface, you can use this formula. Suppose if the surface is having constant theta surface, you know that there is a change in R and there is a change in phi. So this equation you can use for ds. So it basically depends on what surface you are capturing. Okay. And right now I had a question. What will be power density for an isotropic radiator? So let us see that this is my isotropic radiator radiates a power of WR uniformly in all the directions. So at a distance of R, what will be my power density? Tell me quickly.
very good so basically if we see the tropic radiator it is going to cover the radiation in all the directions uniformly so we can say the coverage is a sphere so the power density is defined as the total radiated power divided by the surface area the surface area will be 4 pi r square So next move on to the next one of the important concept that is the radiation intensity. So the radiation intensity, if you see the definition I have given here, that is the total radiated power per unit solid angle. What do you mean by solid angle? Solid angle, I will give you one simple definition, you can remember. So, solid angle will be mentioned for unit radius. Okay, what it means, suppose if you have an antenna located here and you move at a distance of 1 meter. Okay, let us say if you have the radiation pattern is in the form of a spherical. So, I have taken a small part of my spherical surface. So assume that this is a small part which exists on the complete radiation pattern. Okay. If you take a complete sphere and just take small portion about it. So what do you mean by solid angle here was? So what is this plane represents? When you move in this particular direction, what is going to change? Tell me quickly. When you move in a vertical plane and you are at equal distance from the source, let us say this is your origin. When you move in a vertical plane, what value is going to change? Very good. It is theta. And what will happen when you move horizontal plane like this? Five. Okay. So if we trace out this vertical plane variation, okay, and the horizontal plane variation, something like this. And if you multiply both the things, okay, so the change in theta will be, you know, what is the change in theta? R into d theta. And change in phi will be R sin d phi. And you know that solid angle has to be mentioned for unit radius. So in that case, your solid angle can be defined as sin theta d theta d phi. So ultimately, if you see here, this solid angle looks like the angle made by this surface at the origin. So it is basically a two-dimensional angle. So when you multiply the theta variation and when you with phi variation, combinedly you are going to get it as a solid angle. So the solid angle can be represented something like this. If we from the origin point of view, it looks like the angle will be the angle made by the surface. So you know that surface is two dimension. So if you combine or multiply both the variations, you can get the total solid angle. So when you are mentioning about a solid angle, your radius is not going to matter. Okay? So that is the reason why the radius intensity is function of theta and phi. So how it is defined? How much total radiated power divided by in a solid angle? So when you take this particular solid angle, what is the total power concentrated? That is basically called radiation intensity. Just now I have told you, right? The solid angle definition is sine theta into d theta d phi. You can see this. So once you know the radiation intensity, to find out what is the total radiated power, you have to double integrate. So when you are integrating the radiation intensity with respect to this, you know the theta limits and phi limits, you will get what will be the total radiation power. Suppose when you are talking about isotropic antenna, you will get it uh, very clearly. Suppose this is my isotropic uh, antenna, which radiates a power of WR. So you know that what will be the radiation intensity of my isotropic radiator now? Since it is going to cover a complete sphere and as I said radiation intensity has to be defined at 1 meter, 
what will be your radiation intensity can you tell me so the radiation intensity is the power per solid angle so what is the total radiated power that is wr and what is the angle of the n sphere if you take the sphere and calculate the solid angle you are going to get 4 pi how to do that you know the solid angle equation right so to complete the total solid angle what you have to take double integral sin theta d theta d phi so if it is a complete sphere you know theta varies from 0 to 180 degrees and phi varies from 0 to 2 pi so if you that you will get 4 pi so basically 4 pi steradians so the unit of solid angle is steradian so for the complete sphere the solid angle you can assume it as 4 pi steradians using this equation so the radiation intensity for an isotopic radiator is the ratio of radiated power divided by 4 pi is it clear anything you want explanation here i can do power density is different radiation intensity is different power density is how much power is passing through a given surface and the radiation intensity represents in a particular direction when you focus on a particular direction how much power is concentrated in that direction is basically said by the radiation intensity Okay. So when you understand the concept of radiation intensity, the next thing is the field pattern. First of all, you know uh, there are different types of the antennas are there, and based on the design of the antenna, you will you will have the different kind of radiation pattern. Okay, how the radiation pattern is uh, drawn? It can be drawn on a polar plot. first thing i will give an example and i will come back to this diagram and you can understand better okay suppose if you have a dipole antenna you know that the dipole antenna is an omnidirectional antenna which means it can radiate almost uh, into almost equally into every direction so you can see the radiation pattern after a dipole antenna you may have something like a donut kind of shape can cover complete uh, omnidirectional pattern and similarly whereas if you take a horn antenna or something if you take a horn antenna <coughs> these are basically said to be directional antennas directional antennas means what in a certain direction only it is going to create maximum energy whereas if you see in the other dimensions it is not going to create the electromagnetic energy distribution when it comes to the omnidirectional antennas example is uh, dipole antenna and when you consider the directional antenna example is horn antenna actually which is more important or which is more required in the communication point can you tell me will you prefer omnidirectional antenna or directional antenna directional antenna what is the reason to avoid loss okay others okay i will tell an application then you tell me which is more preferred suppose in your house also you will have an wifi antenna if suppose wifi antenna is directional what will happen problem sir <laughs> that's it right see you have to keep your uh, mobile or laptop in the same direction of your uh, wifi antenna if it is a directional antenna yeah. okay so always the directional antennas may not be useful it basically depends on the application right suppose if you want to distribute the energy in everywhere you can go for the omnidirectional antennas see i want to get the wifi signal strength everywhere irrespective of uh, whatever the maybe the value of phi okay so that time of, uh, omni, yeah omnidirectional antenna is better strength will not decrease uh, like which one distributed 
in all directions correct correct that is the reason why suppose since the energy is distributed you can see that the coverage cannot be so much far because the power is distributed everywhere if you take very very far away from the antenna you cannot get any signal yeah suppose what will happen when you take a directional antennas simple example is your parabolic antenna which is located on the top of your house you know so there you know that the satellite signal is uh, going to be directed towards the antenna right they are going to set some kind of mechanism and they will align the antenna to receive the maximum right in that case what is more important directional or otherwise let me give an example suppose i want to transmit from one point to the other point if it is a specific point to point communication you cannot use omnidirectional antennas here because you know that at what particular elevation angle this antenna is located then what you do you focus a highly directional antenna and transmit the energy then by the time it receive the receiving antenna the signal strength will be very high suppose unnecessarily if you are distributing it to other directions what will happen there will be a waste of energy you don't want to transmit in all the direction because if your application is a point to point communication okay so basically the application is actually demanding you know what type of antenna you have to be used whether it is omnidirectional antenna you can use it for applications where you want to receive the signal everywhere and the directional antennas you can use is a point to point communication okay so when you see the field pattern how actually uh, this field pattern has been formed is basically you can see in this diagram so suppose if a dipole antenna or something or let me say a horn antenna sorry dipole so the horn antenna is going to create the maximum radiation along the axis of the antenna now how the radiation pattern is plotted is basically in this polar diagram so first of all you know let us say at this particular point i have 100 volt per meter signal strength okay and when i was at this particular point let us say some 50 volt per meter and here it will be 40 volt per meter so what will happen when you see the radiation pattern of this antenna at each and every value of theta or at each and every value of phi you will get different different field strength so what is the radiation field pattern basically the normalized field pattern represents you see here you have to normalize at every point you know suppose when i was normalizing at this point what is the value you are going to get normalize means you should divide with the maximum electric field so here the electric field is 100 volt per meter and of course that is the maximum irrespective of whatever the location you see so what is the normalized radiation field at this particular point it is equal to 1 okay what is the normalized field at this point point 0.5 and so on so that is how the they will define normalized field pattern or sometimes what they will do no you know instead of normalized field pattern directly they will give the field pattern so field pattern means you can take 150 straight away you can take the absolute list okay now you can see the diagram it will be clearer so what i was doing here i was placing one antenna here the antenna is focusing in this direction which is very very maximum okay you can see here the gain i have mentioned gain i have calculated in dbi that will be 0 db and what will happen when i move to some other angle i can see that the electric field magnitude is changes suppose at this particular point if you consider it's somewhere between minus 10 and minus 20 okay suppose if you consider at the same point let us draw the projection it may be around 0 to minus 10 so the field pattern represents So the field pattern basically represents what is the distribution of the field at various values of the distribution of field at various values of theta and various values of phi. Okay, a field pattern is separately defined for elevation plane and separately defined for azimuthal plane. So when you see the elevation plane, you know that the field is maximum at this point and the field is distributed differently like this. 
So basically, when I say the field pattern, that is the distribution of the electric field for different values of theta. As theta is varying from 90 degrees to 120 degrees, you can see that there is a change in theta. I mean field. If it is going to 40 degrees, you may get a different value. If it is going to 180 degrees, you can get a different value. Yeah. Can ask any questions if you have? So the field pattern is the distribution of the field for different values of the theta. And from the field pattern, it is very important to analyze the first parameter called half power beam width. So you know what is the beam width definition was when you talk when you are talking about beam width, first you identify where the maximum energy is happening. So you can see in this particular example, the maximum energy is happening here. I can call it as a zero dBi. Okay. Now from the same point, you move on either side such that the gain is going to drop by 3 dB. Okay. So I was moving into this particular point and I was finding out a point where the electric field becomes 1 by root 2 times. Suppose at this point you may have 1 volt, 1 volt per meter and you move on this side where you are reaching 1 by root 2 times. And similarly, you move on the right side also, find out where you are reaching 1 by root 2 volt. After finding out this point, you can see here, this is a point where I will have 1 by root 2 volts and this is a point where I have 1 by root 2 volts. Now, the 3 dB beam width is basically represents, you draw a line to origin. Okay? And you know at what value of theta it is, right? And what value of theta it is. So the difference of theta value between these two is basically said to be 3 dB beam width. So what is the significance of 3 dB beam width was? That is a particular portion. Now you can see in this diagram, this is a particular portion. This is a particular portion where the maximum energy is concentrated. So suppose when you see the antenna specifications, they will say, half power beam width is 60 degrees. So suppose if you take that biconical antenna or something else, if it is 60 degrees means the antenna can efficiently radiate up to 60 degrees in the theta plane. And suppose if you point it to 120 degrees, you can see the received signal may not be that much. Okay, Based on the beam width, you can identify that where the maximum power is concentrated. So when I say the half power beam width, so you move from the maximum position to 1 by root 2 times of the peak value. So the difference in the theta value is basically defined it as a half power beam width. And this has to be done for theta plane as well as for phi plane. Any questions you have here? You can, you can ask. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So the next thing, very important thing you have to understand, that is the gain of an antenna. So basically, there are two types of the gains are there. One is the directive gain. And the second one is the power gain. So first I will discuss about directive gain. So the directive gain is defined as the radiation intensity of a practical antenna divided by the radiation intensity of a isotropic antenna. So which means I can define the directive gain as radiation intensity you know that it is a function of theta and phi. And you have seen for isotropic antenna, the radiation intensity is the radiated power divided by 4 pi. So the directive gain is basically defined as 4 pi into psi of theta comma phi divided by wr. And there is one more important parameter called the directivity. 
So you can see here in the example, the direct to gain is a function of theta and phi. So at a particular value of theta, you know that this value is going to be maximum. So that maximum value of direct to gain is also called as directivity. The directivity is basically the maximum value of direct to gain. I will give an example, you can understand it better. So I said that for an isotropic radiator, the coverage is 360 degrees. Okay. So which is going to have a gain of 1. Now I will have, let us say, a dipole antenna where my coverage is only one half cycle. What will happen in this case? If we have a 360 degrees coverage, you can say the gain is unity. Okay. Now, suppose if you have an antenna where if you are covering only 180 degrees, how many times you are improving the efficiency in a particular direction? What will be the gain? Tell me quickly. Two, correct. Because if you see here, since if you give the same power here, power here, whatever the value if you consider here, let us say you may get one watt. If you feed the same power to this particular antenna, you will get two watts, isn't it? Because here the power is distributed over complete surface and the power is distributed only for one half cycle here. So if you get one watt in this particular case, for the same amount of input power, you will get two watts here. What will happen, suppose if I had only 190 degrees, what will be, what will be my gain? My gain will be four times. Okay. So what basically happens here if you are decreasing the bandwidth, you can see that it will be multiplied. Basically, it means if you give the same power to this now, so this can efficiently by four at your isotropic radiator. 10 watts input. Okay. Are you getting any disturbance in my voice? Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me? Now it is clear, sir. Hello. Hello. It's clear now, sir. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay. So if you take an isotropic radiator and if you take this practical antenna, if you give the same amount of power at a certain direction, your whatever the received power, you are going to get four times better to your isotropic antenna. Okay, that is basically called your directive gain. So when you are talking about directive gain, it is always measured by compared with an isotropic antenna. Okay. So that is the reason why even if you want to express this quantity in dBi, you can see that you have to take it as a 10 log. So if you want to express the gain in dB, because it is dealing with the powers, you should take it as a 10 log. So 10 logs directly, you can get the value in order of dBi. Okay. So so also actually says that your gain into bandwidth or beam width is going to be constant. So suppose if your gain is going to be larger, your beam width is going to be come down. Okay, so that is a trade-off. If you want to design a high antenna, you have to compromise with the bandwidth. And if you want to have more bandwidth, you have to compromise on the gain. 
is it clear okay so the next case was the power gain this is very important you can see here the power gain is basically the same definition the radiation intensity of a practical antenna the radiation intensity of isotropic antenna by consider the input power so what is the meaning of this so the power gain is basically defined as the radiation intensity of practical antenna by what he says that you feed the total input power to the isotropic antenna okay. so let us say this is your antenna i was feeding a power of w in and it is radiating a power of wr so radiated power is the output and w in is the input power so when you are talking about power gain what is the definition says you should consider the radiation intensity of isotropic antenna by considering the power let us assume that the full input power is radiated so in that case what is your radiation intensity w in divided by 4 pi that is equal to 4 pi psi of theta comma phi divided by w in So that can be written as 4 pi psi of theta comma phi divided by wr into wr by w in so that this is basically said to be your gain, and this is said to be your efficiency okay so the power gain is basically defined as the directive gain multiplied with the efficiency we have seen in the radiation resistance how to define the efficiency right so there is only one slight difference is there between directive gain and power gain directive gain is defined by considering what is the radiated power whereas the power gain is defining by considering with respect to the input power so when you take with respect to unit power the efficiency comes in picture so the power gain is basically the directive gain into efficiency. Okay, is there any questions you have? You can ask me right now because this is a very important topic. Do you have any questions here? questions my voice audible for you and the next thing is the antenna arrays this is very very important uh, for your gate so the antenna arrays means i told you right there are number of elements which are connected in parallel so as an example let me consider the two element array first So when you consider a two element array, so let me say this is my antenna one and this is my antenna two separated by a distance of D. So what will be the electric field intensity at this particular point? Okay, so let me call the electric field intensity at this point is because of antenna one plus antenna two. Okay, so I can say that the resultant electric field is equal to electric field intensity because of 1 plus because of 2. So let us assume that for both the antennas, what I have supplied the same amount of current, but with different phase. Okay, let me assume that I have supplied 10 ampere current with 0 degrees phase shift here. And I have supplied the same amp uh, 10 ampere current here with 30 degrees phase shift. 
what happens to the magnetic magnitude of electric field intensity here so since you are supplying the same amount of current the amount of electric field here also same but when you compare with the first antenna and second antenna there exists some phase shift okay. so i can say that let me say because of electric field one you may have some e naught is your electric field intensity because of second antenna also you will have the same electric field but with some shift okay. i will tell you how that phase shift is coming so what is the value you are going to get e naught into 1 plus e power j psi so you know that 1 power j theta can be written as cos theta plus j sin theta So tell me the value of magnitude of electric field intensity here. E naught into root over 1 plus cos psi whole square plus sine square psi. So I will tell you once again, you need not to get worried. This is the value of psi here. That is a phase shift between these two antennas. How that phase shift comes, I will do a detailed explanation little bit uh, after uh, after some time okay first you see the magnitude so e naught into root over this will be one plus so cos square psi plus sin square psi you are going to get one plus two cos psi so i can say that magnitude of electric field intensity is equal to e naught into root over two into one plus cos psi That equal to e naught into root over 2 into you know that 1 plus cos psi can be written as 2 cos square psi by 2 so finally what you are going to get 2 e naught cos psi by 2 your electric field intensity generated these two elements now there sometimes they will discuss about normalized electric field. So when you are talking about normalized electric field, you just divide with the maximum value. So here the maximum value comes when psi is equal to zero. So when I say the normalized electric field, you divide with the maximum. Value. Maximum value is two e naught. So when you divide with the ma maximized value, you are going to get cos psi by two itself. Because after you dividing this one with 2 e naught you are going to get cos psi by 2 so this is basically called as an array factor okay forget about that uh, completely so first of all what is the why there is a phase shift between these two so when you are considering this is your point of observation since i was applying the same amount of current but with different phase shift why there is a change in phase shift it's simple you have supplied the same magnitude okay but for the first antenna you supplied the phase current with zero degrees and for the second antenna you supplied the phase shift with 30 degrees so this change in the phase shift is also is one of the contribution why you will get a difference in the phase between the first antenna and second antenna you will have a phase shift because one contribution is due to the different phasor currents. So I can call it as alpha. Okay. So alpha means in this case it is 30 degrees. So you are supplying 0 degrees phase shift here and 30 degrees phase shift here. So this 30 degrees is going to come across at this point also. So what will be the other reason the phase can be different? Can you tell me? What is the other factor? Why the phase can change at this point? You can reply quickly. Distance. Very good. Because the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here is different. Okay, so what is the distance uh, difference in the distance between this one and this one? Okay. 
So for that, let me assume that this is my theta. So the difference between this one and this one can be found out if you draw a perpendicular line here. Let me say this is my perpendicular line. Whatever the distance from here to here and here to here, it is same. So when I different distance, this is purely this one. Will you agree with me? Yes or no? When you find the difference between this parameter and this parameter, this is the only extra distance traveled by the second ray compared to the first one. So what will be this value extra distance if you see this particular triangle? If you see this particular triangle, you know, the spacing between the antennas is D, which is a hypotenuse. So what is this distance? It's not D by cos theta, right? It is D cos theta. Since it is adjacent, you will get hypotenuse times cos theta. Right? So how much phase shift it is going to contribute? You know that if when the distance lambda, you know that the total phase is going to pi radians. Now, what is the distance it is covered right now? D cos theta. So in a distance of lambda, you will get the phase shift of 2 pi radians. So accordingly, proportionately, what is the phase shift happened when it is d cos theta? That is 2 pi by lambda to d cos theta. Agree with me? Just cross multiply 2 pi by lambda into cos theta. Is it clear? In a distance of lambda, you are going to have a phase shift of 2 pi radians. How much phase shift happened if the distance is d cos theta? That will be 2 pi into d cos theta divided by lambda. So this is an additional phase shift and one more contribution is your alpha. So I can simplify this. This 2 pi by lambda is basically said to be your beta itself, the propagation constant. So that will be beta d cos theta. So this is very, very important you have to understand right now. So the total phase shift psi is a contribution of alpha. Alpha means the difference in the phasor currents plus the extra distance also causes for some phase shift. So that additional phase shift is beta d cos theta. So this is a phase shift which is exactly happened right now so now there is very one interesting thing i told you first of all the antenna arrays are going to be more important in order to increase the gain isn't it by cascading it what will happen see the resultant electric field you are getting it as 2 e naught cos psi by 2 so your electric field is going to be maximum provided your psi value has to be equal to zero Yes or no? So the electric field is maximum if psi is equal to zero. Now, in order to make psi is equal to zero, it is there in your hand only. Okay. Now I want uh, the maximum electric field here at theta is equal to 30 degrees. So what I will do in that case right now, I know that my theta value will be 30 degrees. I know the separation between these two antennas. And accordingly, I can find out my value of alpha. So this is basically what it does. If you want to have a particular maxima in a particular direction. Now I want to have the electric field maximum at 30 degrees. So I can do some simple calculation and I will define what will be the value of alpha. Your electric field is maximum provided the total phase shift has to be zero. Right? Suppose if your electric field has phase shift has to be zero and you want to get a theta value of 30 degrees. So at 30 degrees, I want my electric field maximum. And you know the separation. It may be 1 meter or 2 meter. You can easily maintain. And then you come to know the value of alpha. 
let us say alpha has been come as a 30 degrees let us say now what you have to do for the first antenna you supply 10 ampere current with a 0 degrees phase shift and for the second antenna you supply the same current with a 30 degrees phase shift ultimately your electric field is going to be maximum at 30 degrees based upon this combination is it clear anything needs to be explained you can ask me any questions if you have You know, this is very, very important. Suppose if you want to track a particular object. Suppose if the aircraft is moving. Now I want to track the position of the aircraft continuously. So there what actually have to do? Especially at the radar, what will happen? If the target is moving, you have to send an electromagnetic energy in that direction. And you have to see what is the strength of the signal. Based on that, you can estimate what is the range and all. Now in these applications, I want to focus the energy at a particular angle. Now if the target is moving from one place to other place means, what you have to do? You have to focus the energy from this position to this position. You cannot manually move the antenna at the base station, right? Suppose if the target is moving continuously, you cannot move the, tar move the antenna at the base station. So what you can do, you supply the different different currents to the antenna and you can control the beam. If suppose may is equal to 30 degrees, you may get a maximum at 30 degrees elevation angle. Example, accordingly, suppose if I give a phase shift of 100 degrees, you may get somewhere around 80 degrees or 90 degrees, the maxima can be occurred. So what happening here by supplying different currents to the antennas you are controlling the beam okay first case the beam is focused at 30 degrees and the second case beam is focused at 60 degrees so this process is called electronic steering you need not to manually move the antenna which is located at the base station by supplying the different currents to the antennas your beam has been controlled Is it clear? This process is called electronic steel. So the next case, having said that, so in the element case, your electric field you are getting two e cos psi by two. Right? So this is the contribution of two factors. One is the difference in the phase are current plus the other one is the difference in the distance. Now, let me consider there are two elements here, the first antenna and second antenna. So the first case is, for both the antennas, I was supplying the same magnitude with the same phase. So alpha is equal to zero degrees. And the distance between these two, I have taken it as one half of the wavelength. So tell me at what point of theta your electric field is maximum. Everybody got my question. So in my case, alpha is equal to 0 degrees and distance is lambda by 2. Now I want to find out what value of theta my electric field is maximum. You seen here, your electric field is maximum provided your total phase shift has to be 0 degrees. So you just equate psi is equal to 0 degrees. So what will happen? That is equal to 0 plus 2 pi by lambda into lambda by 2 into cos theta. Okay. So what happens in this case? You are getting modulus of cos theta is equal to 0. So theta can be equal to either pi by 2 or minus pi by 2. Okay. So what it means? you will have the electric field maximum at plus 90 or you will have the electric field maximum at minus 90, something like this. And let us say this is theta equal to zero degrees and so on. This is 180 degrees and so on. So when you configure this particular case, you can see that 
you can focus the energy at plus 90 and minus 90. So if you are getting the maxima in the vertical plane, that is basically said to be a broad side array. If you are getting the theta in the vertical plane, maximum electric field in the vertical plane, this configuration is called broadside array. So in case of a broadside array, not only elements, you may have different different elements, some five to six elements will be connected in parallel. For all the antennas, you are going to supply the same current with same phase. And the distance between adjacent antennas will be exactly lambda by two. So when you do for the broadside array, having said that, you are going to get the electric field maximum in plus 90 and minus 90. Is the concept clear? I'm not getting any feedback from you. Yeah. Now, next thing you do and tell me what happens when alpha is equal to 180 degrees and D is equal to lambda by two. So tell me at what angle I will get a maximum. So your psi is equal to alpha plus beta d cos theta. What is the condition here? There are two antennas. So for the first antenna, second antenna, there is a phase shift of 180 degrees in the current. And the distance between these two is again lambda by two. So do it and tell me. Pi. Correct. You take the modulus. You take the modulus. I want this modulus. So alpha is equal to pi and beta is 2 pi by lambda into lambda by 2 into cos theta is equal to 0. So you can say pi into plus cos theta is equal to 0. And you can say cost modulus of cos theta is equal to 1. You can say plus 1 or minus 1 it can be. So your theta can be either 0 degrees or it can be plus or minus 180 degrees. Right. So when you take the modulus on both the sides, the cos theta can be either plus 1 or minus 1. So if it is plus 1, you are going to get the field at 0 degrees. And if it is minus 1, you are going to get it 180 degrees. So this is 180 degrees and this is 0 degrees. So this is basically said to be your end fire array. Okay. So when you supply opposite phasor current and sp spacing is lambda by 2, you are going to get the uh, maximum electric field in the horizontal plane. So that configuration is said to be your end fire array. So that's it. Now the main fundamental principle here was when you are talking about antenna arrays, there are two things. By controlling different currents to different antennas, you can focus the energy in a particular direction. And electric field is going to be maximum provided the total phase has to be equal to zero. So these are the two points which you have to remember. So when you remember, all the problems are very simple. Okay. And anyhow, this freeze transmission equation is not there in the syllabus. Okay. Uh, in the presentation part, anyhow, I will uh, do the derivation part and I will upload it. Okay. As of now, since time is not there, we'll skip because that is not in not there in the gate syllabus. So let us try to solve some problems right now. So see the first question. So at a distance of 8 kilometer from a differential antenna, the field strength is 12 micro volt per meter. Then find the field strength at a location 20 kilometers from the source. Can you tell me what is the value? First of all, you answer me this question. Since the distance is in the order of kilometer, 
will you consider that as a near field or far field yes because the distance is quite far 8 km generally you don't have the antenna dimensions in the order of kilometer right so compared to the antenna element your distance is very very far so you can consider this example as a far field assumption so i told you in the case of first uh, discussion in the far field your electric field proportionate to 1 by r only your 1 by r square and 1 by r cube term can be neg so in that case what will happen so e1 divided by e2 is equal to r2 by r1 so what is e1 e1 here so 12 microvolt per meter divided by e2 is equal to r2 is 20 km and r1 is 8 km so you can simplify that value tell me what is the value you are getting so which option you are getting so you are going to get 4.8 microvolt per meter isn't it so here you have to remember that this is only very important suppose if the person is given the value in near field it is proportional to 1 by r square and 1 by r cube and if it is in the far field it is proportional to 1 by r next question so if i understand about the gain of the antenna you will be able to answer this so consider there is a lossless antenna with a directive gain of 6 dBi if 1 milliwatt power is fed to the antenna then what is the total power radiated by the antenna so this is my antenna having a directive gain of 6 dBi and i have a power of 1 milliwatt so what will be the radiated power So tell me, what is the value? So what is the value? Simple here. This is not a matter right now because he this fellow has given it is a lossless antenna. What do you mean by lossless antenna? For a lossless antenna, your efficiency is hundred percent, isn't it? so the ratio of output power divided by the input power is equal to 1 gain is a different thing you forget about that gain has nothing to do between the relation between wr and w in it is only the efficiency okay so when your efficiency is 100% your radiated power should be same as your input power so the answer is here 1 milliwatt So, you have any questions here to ask? Gain is no matter here. Gain is a different thing. How efficiently it can radiate compared to the isotropic? So, that is a different thing. But what is the question he is asked here? How much power is radiated when you give one milliwatt of power? Yeah, you can ask me the question. Okay, sir. So, if it is not mentioned, lossless. Hello. We will use the formula. 
gp is equal to gp i'm not able to listen your voice maybe you are speaking but i am not getting here okay clear okay next one see this one the transmitting antenna radiates at 251 watts isotropically okay and a receiving antenna located 100 meter away from the transmitting antenna has an effective aperture of 500 cm square then find the total power received by the antenna so there is a transmitting antenna which radiates a power of 251 watts after traveling 100 meter distance you have another receiving antenna where area is to 500 cm square then find out what is the received power so first of all you know since it is an isotropic antenna what is the power density after reaching 100 meter what is the power density after traveling 100 meter that will be the total power radiated divided by 4 pi r square since it is isotropic antenna the power density will be power per 4 pi r square because the coverage is a sphere so once you know the power density and if you multiply with the area you will get what is the received power okay in order to do the received power what you have to do what will be the power density at the output multiplied by the area okay you can do the simplification 251 divided by 4 pi just a second you can do the calculation and tell me what is the value i will be back Okay, you can do the calculation and tell me what is the value. Four pi r square into area will be five hundred centimeter square. Ten power minus four. So tell me what is the value you got. So approximately you are going to get hundred microwatt, isn't it? Ninety nine microwatts. Verified anybody? You can cross check what is answer you got. so the next one yeah so the next one this is this kind of problems are keep on repeating like this kind of problem so they have given the radiation pattern you know radiation pattern is nothing but your radiation intensity okay. don't get confused with the terminology so the radiation pattern has been given in a theta plane so you can assume that phi has been not given so you take phi will be from 0 to 2 pi then what will be the value of directivity okay. so first of all i told you the directivity is basically the maximum value of directive gain right so you know that based upon the derivation the directive gain is equal to 4 pi times the radiation intensity divided by the radiated power so radiation intensity already you know that is a cos power 4 theta how to find out the radiated power to find out the radiated power i have given one equation right 
So when you are double integrating the radiation intensity over a solid, you will get the total power. Right? Because the radiation intensity is the ratio of the radiated power per solid angle. So to get the total radiated power, multiply the radiation intensity with the solid angle. Right? Now psi of theta comma phi is already given cos power 4 theta. So your theta varies from 0 to pi by 2 and phi varies from 0 to 2 pi. And tell me what is the answer you are getting? Radiated power. Cos power 4 theta. Okay. Sin theta. D theta d phi. And theta is varying from 0 to pi by 2. And phi is varying from 0 to 2 pi. So, what is the radiated power you are going to get? With respect to phi straight away, I can take 2 pi, which is a constant. And integration of cos power 4 theta, sin theta, d theta. So, theta is varying from 0 to pi by 2. So, how to do this integration? We know one formula, right? So, what is that formula? So, suppose integrating f dash of theta into f of theta. whole power n. So the answer is going to f of theta whole power n plus 1 by n plus 1. You can do it in a different way, you know, you, you are the expert in mathematics, right? So if you take cos theta is a t, sorry, sin theta is equal to t, cos theta d theta can be equated to d t. So you can conform or uh, transform this variable into one parameter. So you are going to get this one only. So according to that, I can take f of theta can be cos theta. So f dash theta can be equated to minus sin theta. Right? So in I make in that form, I will multiply with minus 1 and I will put minus here for this. So using this formula, so straight away what I can say, created power is equal to minus 2 pi into cos power phi theta divided by phi. From 0 to pi by 2. Okay. So when you substitute the upper limit anyhow, cos pi by 2 is 0. And when you substitute the lower limit, it's minus 1 by 5. So the radiated power you are going to get it as 2 pi by 5. Correct. So what is the directive gain in this 4 pi using this equation? Psi of theta comma phi will be cos power 4 theta divided by 2 by 5. So this is equal to 10 times cos power 4 theta. So can you tell me what is the relativity right now? Tell me what is the directivity? So that is a maximum value, right? So maximum value is your theta will be 1. So directivity will be 10. But actually, if we see the options, he has given in terms of dB. So how to convert this quantity in dB? Is it 10 log or 20 log? It should be 10 log. So when you are expressing it in dBi or dB, so you should take 10 log of 10. The answer is going to be 10 dBi itself. 10 log 10 is straight away 10. So I will repeat this problem again. You see, once any radiation is known, to find out the directivity, so the directivity is the maximum value of directive gain. So you know that the directive gain is equal to 4 pi into radiation intensity divided by the radiated power. So since radiation intensity is given, it's okay. You have to find out what is the radiated power. 
So to find out the radiated power, you have to take the double integration of radiation intensity over a solid. So in this case, theta is varying 0 to pi by 2 and phi is varying from 0 to 2 pi. So you calculated the power. Then you know the value of GD. And then you can define the directivity. So is there anything you have here in this? Because this kind of problems only are repeating. Okay. We'll go to the next one then, last one. So there is a half hole which is kept horizontally at a height of lambda by 2 above a perfect conducting infinite ground plane. Radiation pattern approximately. So what he is telling, there is a conducting ground plane, and one half wave dipole is located here at a height of h. So that h, sorry, at a height of lambda by two. Sorry. So what happens to be the radiation pattern? So what I can say right now in this case. This example can be considered as an example of two element array. How? Because whatever the electric field generated is, it is going to be reflected back because it is a conducting ground plane. So the same method of images can be applied here. Will you agree with me? Any electric field hitting on a conductor, everything gets reflected back. This can be done by taking into one image source which is below the ground plane and at the same distance lambda by 2. If suppose if this is charged to positive, what will happen? This has to be your negative as per the method of images are concerned. Are you able to hear me? So you can consider this is your first antenna element right now and second antenna element right now. So what is the total distance between these two? Tell me quickly, what is the total distance between these two? lambda? And what is the total phase shift in terms of the current? If this is positive, what happens in your method of images? You would have been remembered, I guess. So, if it is positively charged, this antenna, this is going to be negatively charged. But it is given dipole is at lambda by 2. Correct. Dipole is at lambda by 2. That is true. But if you want to solve the radiation pattern, it is going to create an image, right? Actually, not physically creating. This reflected electric field is contributed by the image source. So even though it is at a distance of lambda by 2 in the ground plane, your image source also can be assumed to be at a lambda by 2 distance. So dipole means like uh, plus q and minus q. This is q. the concept Some that we have done in method of images. Uh, yes, sir. Here, instead of talking about charges, this time we are talking about antennas. Okay. Same thing. Okay. No other uh, confusion here. Okay. And since what happened, this is positive, this is going to be negative. So your alpha is going to be 180 degrees. So what you can do in order to verify where the maximum electric field occur, I told you, right? So there are different, different options are given. Just verify in the options where the maximum electric field is happening. So the maximum electric field happens provided your total phase shift will be zero degrees. Which means the total phase shift is a combination of alpha plus beta d cos theta. You know that in this case, alpha is like this because one is positive and one is negative. So alpha is pi and beta is 2 pi by lambda and d is lambda into cos theta is equal to 0. 
So what you are going to get? 1 plus 2 pi cos theta is equal to 0 pi. So you can say that cos theta can be exactly 1 by 2. It can be plus 1 by 2 or minus 1 by 2. So what is the value of theta here? You are going to get 60 degrees and 120 degrees. So you can verify in the options. So second option is satisfied. You will have a magnitude at 60 degrees and you will have at 120 degrees. Okay. So this kind of problems are given. So you have to do the verification. So once again, I'm getting this problem. This isn't here because I was not getting the feedback in audio. If you have any concern, uh, try to post it in message. I don't know the reason being why I was not getting the audio. Okay. So what is this question? There is a dipole antenna located at a height of lambda by 2. So whatever the electric field generated from this and if it is hitting the conducting plate, it is going to create another reflected wave. Which means that the incident and reflected are 180 degrees phase shift, right? So the reflected wave is accounted by taking an another dipole which is located below the ground plane at the same distance. That's what we have seen in method of images. So this you can consider as a one element and this is your second element with a total separation of lambda and the phase shift is 180 degrees because your incident and reflected waves are 180 degrees phase shift. So in that case, you can know that if there is zero degrees current supplied here, you can assume 180 degrees is supplied here. Then the next case is you need to find out the value of theta where your electric field is maximum. So your electric field maximum, if you want to do, you have to equate the total phase equal to zero. So after doing that, you will get theta equal to 60 degrees and 120 degrees. So by verifying the options, option B is correct. Okay, some more problems we can discuss in antennas uh, in the revision class. In the revision class, or uh, one more class is there, I told you, right, yesterday also, in the previous class. When we are discussing the pure problems, then we can discuss more problems in the antennas. And till that time, you can uh, go through the concepts of antennas and I don't think you have to go to multiple sources or multiple books. Not required for the antenna part is concern. So if you are thorough here with whatever I have said in the antenna part, it is more than enough. And if you see the previous year questions also, all the questions has been related to the activity or it can be the antenna arrays. Just only go through those fundamental concepts. Now, if you have any questions, you can discuss. So with this, actually, I was concluding it from my side. If there is a circular waveguide is there. I will discuss in 15 to 20 minutes in the next time. Other than that, everything subject is completed except the circular waveguide. Okay. So if you have any questions or concerns, you just let me know. Uh, let me know. Yeah. So finally, how was the subject overall? Is it easy or is it difficult right now? What is your opinion? Others also, at least uh, I won't answer from everybody because that is what actually missing in the class, you know. So from my side, if you want to give the feedback, the only part which I was missing is the feedback from your side. Starting from the first class, that was actually missing. No. So because uh, you are lucky people, you know, 14, 16 people will be there maximum. So in that case, actually, the interaction could have been more better. That is what the only concern from my side. Because 
through a discussion i find it more difficult part in that only i was keep on asking the question and nobody is replying so that's where actually i felt somewhat a little bit more difficult so which actually makes me that you are not understanding the concepts so that is the only concern from my side other than that especially when it comes to the problem solving everything and all you are really good okay and the only thing what it requires from now is i have concluded from my side so the next thing what you have to do was completely go through the classroom notes as per the theory part is uh, concept and the next thing is solve the classroom problems only whatever i have discussed and once you are done with this then you can go for the previous year gate problems okay even i was going to release uh, every year previous gate problems related to emt starting from 2020 19 18 like that i was going to release it in by the end of this month we can go through my video lectures also not a problem you can ask dinesh sir he will be able to share you the links already i had uh, done up to 2016 so i was down starting from 2020 so almost 5 years has been completed so like that i will co complete at least up to 2000 so last 20 years that is more important in order to get more confidence you know and in the next class there is one more class i told you in the last time only there will be a surprise class so regarding that class timing will be announced only half day or maximum one for that so you should be ready by that time so why actually i was asking that class was you know so i want to see how much is your understanding so in my next class so the curriculum goes like this for the first 15 minutes i will talk about circular wave gates then the next thing is i will do one question here and i will put a timer here in my screen only and i was just waiting within how many minutes you are able to solve i want to know your understanding and uh, how fast you are able to do that so that will be actually helpful for you so be prepared for that class and if you have any doubts during that course you know maybe it will take another 15 days above 15 days only i am going to conduct the next class so 15 to 20 days time so please go through all the concepts and be ready for the next class so while solving if you get any doubt you can approach me in whatsapp okay because i may not be able to see in the group you know uh, if i see the group it's everything is mixed so that is the reason why i don't know uh, how to answer for that so you can directly approach me in whatsapp okay and send a snapshot of that i may be able to respond within half day maximum okay so that's all from my side now if you had any comments uh, you can tell regarding the feed and what way how to improve so that is more important for me even to explore for the next session sandar okay so what is your comment what is your feedback you can just uh, give it to me in two to three words So nobody is there. So where actually you felt the difficulty part, you can uh, put it right now. Maybe I will be able to address not only this. If you had any tips regarding the preparation aspect or something else, you can ask me. Okay, I will be always available on WhatsApp also. Uh, you need not be worry. Okay. So in the next. in this please concentrate on the whole uh, theory part and practice more number of problems okay that's all from my side uh, i can sign out right now thank you very much